Welcome to my lecture on the many benefits of humor. We can't possibly treat this topic exhaustively. There's just too much. Uh, but I hope you get a flavor of it and enjoy yourself while you're at it. It has been said that the surest way to make a joke not funny is to study it. Uh, you take humor and you apply serious research methods to it and you pretty much have um, a serious, non-funny lecture. Um, that may be the case here. Uh, but the point is that if you're looking at the benefits of humor, what you really want is not a bunch of people sitting around saying, hey, I like humor because what you want is to look at scholars in various fields who've studied humor and who found benefits um, in their research. Uh, so yes, there is such a thing as humor studies. Um, humor itself is even a science uh, by today's definition of science. Um, and humor scholarship can be found in so many different areas and we'll see examples in this lecture. Um, scholars who study uh, business, the workplace, human resources, education, politics, um, medicine, healing, psychology, sociology, all of those areas are, are fair game uh, for humor study. And we're going to see some examples of lots of different areas coming up. Humor is a bonding device. Um, it has been shown to reduce distance between the teller and the listener. That's very important in the workplace, whether it's between um, a superior and a subordinate, or people who are at the same level, uh, people who are in the same team. And research has shown that uh, in the workplace, humor can boost employee morale, even lead to improved productivity, which is always important, um, facilitate communication. Uh, um, admittedly, sometimes uh, humor um, can get in the way of communication if something is if, is misstated. Uh, and if, if humor is used in the wrong way, we will actually look at in a later lecture um, at the topic of toxic humor in the workplace and um, how that comes about and what we can do about it. Uh, humor has been shown to help build relationships, bonding device, facilitate cohesiveness of a group belonging for sure. Um, uh, help uh, build relationships. This sounds like it might be repeti repetitive, but I'm not changing it at this point. Um, and of course, uh, enhance organizational culture since with humor, we're establishing bonds and, and a group sense of group belonging. With, and so it can only help organizational culture as opposed to splitting people apart. Now, an example of a, a, an area that was studied, one of the more interesting examples, I think, is some researchers uh, studied humor among sex workers and found that prostitutes uh, used humor as a way to bond, and not only that, but to cope um, with the, the difficulties in their workplace. Reduced stress, Th what they would do is they would mock their clients uh, behind, obviously not when the clients were around, um, and, um, and and share stories. Isn't that nice to know? Yeah, let's all stay away from prostitutes. Um, but it's a very it's very interesting when you think about. It, it's one of the more interesting studies because um, in in that kind of a situation, if humor can help reduce stress with uh, among female sex workers, well how much can it help in other kinds of stress, stressful professions like professors who have to speak clearly when they do their lectures on, uh, on YouTube? Yes, let's think about that for a minute. Humor in education is an obvious fit. Uh, in fact, research has shown that uh, humor decreases students' anxiety, helps them perform on a test if, they, if their anxiety is reduced. Um, improves the ability to learn and remember what you have learned. If something is presented um, in, the, in a humorous context, you remember it better. Um, it can boost students' self-esteem. 
Uh, it can bring the student closer to the teacher. Remember this notion of reducing distance between uh, the teller and the listener um, and naturally encourage a more receptive uh, learning atmosphere for the same reasons. And it's interesting to note um, that humor in the classroom, quote unquote, uh, goes back to, to, the, to ancient times. Um, in the time of the, uh, that, of the Talmudic sages, uh, about 1700 years ago, um, Rabbah, a very, very famous Talmudic sage, would always say something humorous before he started his class, which is something a lot of teachers still do today. Uh, politicians are known to do that. You start with a joke and people are more receptive. They laugh and then he would begin his lecture and the audience would be more engaged. Another Talmudic sage, Rabbi Meir, uh, was an expert in fox fables, kind of like Aesop's fables. And um, fully one third of his lectures were devoted to parables. Uh, presumably the parables were related to the topic of the lecture. Um, I guess similar to my YouTube videos in this course. And um, um, they were also, they, they would help engagement because they were humorous uh, and relevant. Uh, so it's interesting to note that humor has been used in education since ancient times and not only secular education, but even in religious instruction. One of the modalities by which uh, this sort of humor and any humor in the classroom works is no doubt uh, by reducing the distance between the teacher and the students. Um, you establish a bond, you establish a relationship when you use humor. Uh, doesn't say it over here in the slide, but in particular, self-deprecating humor uh, happens to, to do that. Um, a warm human relationship. We look at the instructor more as a human being uh, instead of somebody, hopefully, that we should get around and, and, and get one over on, let's say that. Um, and and the, this is a very nice quote, Victor Borgia, the Danish comedian. Uh, if you haven't seen anything of his, look him up. Um, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. Very funny guy. Um, one study that was interesting to me because, you know, Seinfeld, um, students were shown an episode of Seinfeld before they had to do a stressful um, uh, uh, project. And that, what that was is they had to give an impromptu speech in front of a camera, which is stressful. Students who had not watched the Seinfeld episode um, their heart rates, heartbeats rose to an, a hundred on the average, 100. And the ones who had, uh, they only rose to 80 to 85 beats per minute. Um, so if you reduce anxiety, you re if you use humor to reduce anxiety, reduce stress, um, the result is that uh, the students are better able to cope um, with what they have to do for class. Advertising is one field which needed no help in understanding the value of humor. They were putting humor in their ads uh, before um, researchers uh, were studying what it did. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there has been a lot of uh, humor and a lot of the study of humor in advertising. Just a couple of examples. Um, one study analyzed over 1,000 television commercials uh, on 150 different elements and found a, a very high correlation between humor and recall. That was the highest correlation that they, that they found in, the whole, in, in that whole study and all the 150 elements uh, with each other. Um, so people are, and you know, as a, as a person who views commercials, I'm sure you agree with that. You're much more likely to uh, remember a commercial that you've seen if there was humor involved. Um, and there you go, another study uh, corroborated, 17% uh, more viewers uh, remembered a commercial if it was humorous as opposed to the typical uh, commercial. Um, I don't know if you even remember the humorous milk campaign by the milk industry, uh, but yes, it definitely was remembered by people because it was humorous. Um, in the next slide, um, we'll see a commercial from 
uh, Israel for the Israeli television provider, yes, which uses many of the devices we studied in the previous lecture um, on the, the uh, different types of humor. Um, and it's a, a parody of uh, the Village People song, um, the YMCA. And I'm telling you all this now because I'm having a little trouble getting my narration and the YouTube audio to work together on the same slide. Uh, so we're going to the next one now, and we'll we'll take a look at it. For now, I'm not including uh, videos uh, to play in my lectures. There are a few issues related to that, so this might be a good time for you to pause and click on the link and view the video on your own. Uh, medicine and the healing professions. It's another area where. Uh, there's a lot of research. I, I think I have more examples here than actual uh, sources, which but you can find it all over the place. Even the expression laughter is the best medicine uh, shows you how important uh, humor is to medicine and healing. Um, for one thing, yes, there is such a thing as a medical clown. There are schools that you can go to to become a medical clown. It's an actual profession. Uh, that's how important humor is to medicine. Hospitals employ them. And I know uh, anyone watching the, this video now and listening to my voice is probably scrambling to write down, look up schools for medical clowns because I'm changing my career. Who wouldn't want to be a medical clown? That's amazing. Um, two very well-known examples. Uh, Norman Cousins wrote a book decades ago about how he uh, coped with and eventually uh, came out of extremely painful disease, he made sure that he watched several minutes a day of uh, funny television shows that provoked very strong laughter in him. Had to be very funny shows. Um, and the, the actor Christopher Reeve, who was in the early Superman movies, uh, he, uh, after a riding accident, he was paralyzed from the neck down, very morose. He was very upset. He was com contemplating suicide. This is his, his initial hospitalization. All of a sudden, a doctor comes in in a white coat and a mask and um, talking a mile a minute in a heavy ru Russian accent. And he says he's going to cure him. He's a proctologist. And he's going to examine him right now. He's going to do a practicological exam. Um, and when at, at obviously pretty pretty quickly, uh, while Christopher Reeve was a little bit panicky, um, the the doctor revealed himself as Robin Williams, who was a friend of his. And when Christopher Reeve, in in his book that he wrote about his his experiences, uh, referred to this anecdote to this um, time period, he said that was the first time he laughed, and the laughter gave him hope, and changed his life. Specifically, cancer patients and chemotherapy patients, and especially younger people, teenage uh, chemotherapy patients, have their own uh, support groups, websites uh, that help them out. But in particular, there are some support groups and websites uh, that are, are de devoted to uh, humor, the humor of being a cancer patient, believe it or not. One example is, um, uh, I don't have to worry about my shampoo anymore because my hair fell out from chemotherapy. And it's, uh, that's, that's a little piece of humor. You might not, you, you know, you might think it's tragic humor, and possibly it is, um, but it's a way of coping. Uh, if you just do a little Google search on this, I'm sure you'll come up with a lot of examples on your own. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor the point, except to say that I had a student years ago um, who was go it, at Baruch and going through chemo while she was still continuing in college. Um, and her, she's coming through um, to the vertical campus building in the days when they still allowed smoking right outside the doors instead of uh, the situation well before COVID, uh, where you were not allowed to smoke right outside the doors. Uh, so she passed a, a friend of hers, a classmate, who, who offered her a cigarette. And she said, no thanks, I already have cancer. Similarly, there's a huge body of humor by and for disabled people. 
Um, and again, I'm not going to look at it. You're, the, you can find a lot of it on your own. I have a friend who's writing a, an, a book, uh, an entire book on, um, you know, humor related to disabilities by and for disabled people. Um, this, this little image here is, is adorable. Uh, uh, disabilities awareness training. It reminds me of something that could have occurred, could have appeared in an episode of the television show, The Office. Um, but it, it didn't, but it could have. We've already seen that humor uh, can reduce anxiety in students. Uh, and basically, overall, in, in anyone, in any situation, uh, humor relaxes people, uh, reduces anxiety, reduces tension. It's basically a stress buster. Um, so when necessary, humor can definitely act as a stress buster. Um, it can be used in relationships, it can be used in education, and believe it or not, it can be used in getting even. And we'll see uh, one or two examples now, but we'll look at this much more in a later lecture on uh, social justice humor and how humor can be used in the service of social justice. Here's an example of humor being used as a stress buster and um, an educational tool. Great comic. Uh, uh, once again, I'm going to ask you to pause this uh, slideshow, depending on how you're viewing it, uh, and click on the link. You'll be going to YouTube uh, to watch this uh, very funny brief bit. Some examples of getting even humor, uh, and I'm sure you have more to contribute on your own, it's going from bottom to top. Um, your one of the required viewings in this course is the movie The Producers by Mel Brooks it goes back to 1967. Uh, Mel Brooks uh, said that his movie The Producers was a way of getting even with Hitler. He said it straight out. Of course, it's impossible to really get even with Hitler, um, but he felt that by using comedy to mock, you rob Hitler of his power and any possibility of, of building myths around him. Uh, and this, was the, this is his, his words, and um, I'm very happy to have it because it matches the kinds of things we're talking about in this class. Um, how about women getting even uh, for sexist treatment by men? A woman needs a brain transplant. The doctor tells her, well, a man's brain costs eight hundred thousand dollars. A woman's brain only costs one hundred thousand dollars. And that naturally, she gets offended, and asks why. The doctor says, well, "That's because uh, women's brains have been used. They're marked down." Um, that's a targeted, targeted joke, not at women, but at men. Finally, uh, and then Tori and Hughes, very, very good uh, stuff. Uh, if you're black in America. You're w relatively well-spoken, well-dressed, well-educated. Sooner or later, you can count on one of your white contemporaries with the very best of intentions turning to you and saying something like, you're so cool. Sometimes I actually have trouble remembering you're black. You know, like that, that that's a compliment. Uh, no, I mean that. Sometimes I really forget you're black. Yeah, well, let me marry your sister. I'm sure it'll pop right back into your mind. Uh, getting even humor. Another wonderful example of getting even humor. I'm hoping you're going to pause this slideshow and go to that link and hear him tell it on his own. Uh, very, very frenetic delivery. Um, and and it, there's nothing like uh, hearing as opposed to reading it. So uh, that's it for me. You should definitely look at that on your own. Irony and satire. At the time of um, I'm, that I'm recording this lecture, September 2020, um, there was this was passed around uh, quite a bit on Facebook. Uh, an image uh, from a news source: residents of a uh, quiet Rhineland city awoke Monday to discover what was defaced. A Nazi resting place was defaced um, with images of uh, the Jewish star, six-pointed star. Uh, the word Israel, the word chosen people, um, and uh, it, it, it's a lot of people thought this was um, true news, real news, 
but the source uh, was actually the onion and anything that comes from the onion, as you know, is, is simply humor. And this was clearly a takeoff on the Jewish cemeteries that have been defaced with Nazi images. Do this on your own. That's just a picture of a web page. Uh, go to the link uh, to a page which is titled Laughter is the Best Medicine. And uh, they list lots and lots of benefits of humor, um, you know, many more than what we have discussed here in this lecture today.